A very good day to you and welcome to the program. I want to go right to the point. Today we are speaking about standing up for Jesus Christ. You know, it's a funny thing. I hear a lot of people praying these days and they pray, dear God, and God do this and God do that. And a lot of the songs as well are about God, we love you and God is love. But we never hear the word Jesus. Jesus Christ. When we hear that word, it does one of two things. It either draws people to you, warms people to you, or it repels people from you. Because that's the name, okay, which is above every other name. When you talk about God, God is who you presume Him to be. God, if you are a man that uh, loves uh, hugging the trees, then that's your God. If your God is um, the God of Islam or the God of um, the Hindus or the God of the Buddhists, then no one is offended. But when you m mention the name of Jesus Christ, then it's like all hell breaks loose sometimes. I know because I've done it myself. How many times do people say, oh God, see? But when you talk about Jesus that is where the, the reputation and that is where the name, which is above all other names, is represented. Now, I want to speak to you today about not being ashamed of the name of Jesus Christ. Of course, there's one scripture, I think you already know it. It's found in the book of Romans chapter 1 verse 16 and I'm reading out of the New King James Version. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of God, no, Christ. For it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes. For the Jew first and then for the Greek. Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. And Paul paid the ultimate price. Paul was a martyr for his faith. Paul got his head cut off with a sword. Okay? Why? Because a Roman citizen was not allowed to be crucified. That's the only reason. Paul was a citizen of Rome. Peter, that's right, the big fisherman, he was crucified for his faith. He was actually crucified upside down, the legend tells us, because he said, I'm not worthy to die as my Savior. Now that's the same Peter who denied Jesus three times when the servant girl said, aren't you with him? So what happened? He got filled with the Holy Spirit and power. And I'm going to pray for you at the end of this program that God will fill you with His Spirit so that you might be bold to speak up for the gospel. I just feel in these days in which we are living, we really need to be more outspoken for Jesus Christ. You know, folks, it's not ISIS that concerns me or these militant uh, groups, El Shabab and so on. The people that concern me are the lukewarm, compromised Christians who will intimate that all roads lead to heaven and just do your best and don't overdo it and don't go over the top. I'll never forget when I was um, a young man preaching down in the Eastern Cape to a whole lot of farmers. And I love farmers because I am a farmer. And I'll never forget at half time, I, I went into the bathroom and um, an old man came in, probably my age now actually. <laughs> and he said, son, uh, when you preach, you don't have to sweat so much. In other words, you don't have to overdo it. I looked at the old gentleman and I said, sir, you ain't seen nothing yet. Wait for the second half. <laughs> but we need to be bold, you know. And I know that, the, you know that not one disciple died of old age. Do you know that? Not one, including John. They tell me that John was strangled and then I think he was boiled in oil. Uh, Thomas had his head cut off in India. Um, Andrew died a martyr's death. Um, Philip, or every single one of them. Okay, James, uh, the brother of Jesus, had his head cut off. I want to tell you that that name is, brings salvation to some 
and brings the, 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 the hellishness of the devil into other people's lives because it exposes people. It's the name above every other name. So what am I speaking about today? I'm speaking about standing up for Jesus Christ. And I hope I'm speaking to a lot of young people because one day when I'm not here, you'll still be standing up. And this compromise is the most dangerous thing that we are facing. And it's coming through the church where people will try and water down the gospel. There's no watering down of the gospel. You know, John chapter 14, verse 6, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one goes to the Father but by me. What does that scripture mean? It means that there is no other God. In fact, if you go to the book of Exodus, the Lord will say, there is no other God. And if you know of one, please tell me, because I don't know of any other. So are you saying that that's the only way? Yes, that's what I'm saying, because I believe this book. That's why I'm saying it. Now, just by saying that, you see, you become offensive. In some first world countries, they will even arrest you for hate speech. What I've just said, they will call hate speech. How can you say that? How can you say that all these other religions are wrong and only Christianity is right? Because that's what I believe and that's what the Bible says. First for the Jew and then for the Greek. Who's the Greek? The Gentile. It's you and me. I want to tell you something now. I am not ashamed of the gospel. You say to me, how can you be so right about that? Because I was lost before I met him on the 18th of February 1979 in a little Methodist church in the main street of Greytown. That's why. I'm not talking about somebody I, I read about or somebody I studied at university. I'm talking about a man that I met that saved my life. That's what I'm talking about. That's why I cannot condone any other God. Because I'm denying the one who saved me. See? And of course, I'm saying this in love. He is. He's the God of love. He loves everybody. He died for all the Muslims, all the Hindus, all the Buddhists, all the Satanists, all the atheists. He died for all men. But he expects us, you and me, when we meet him and make him Lord of our lives, he expects us to stand up for him. Now, I want to go to another scripture. And this is found in the, in the book of uh, 2 Timothy, chapter 1. And I'm just reading a verse here from verse 8. Now remember, as far as I'm concerned, the greatest of all the apostles was Paul. No doubt. He paid the ultimate price. He really suffered. And Jesus told him that you will suffer. Remember when uh, the Lord knocked him off his horse? He was on his way to where? To Damascus. To do what? To arrest the Christians. He thought he was doing the right thing. He stood there and he held all the coats of the very men that stoned Stephen to death. The first martyr, by the way, in the New Testament. And God met him and knocked him off his horse and he said, Lord, who are you? He said, I am Jesus. See, I am Jesus. From that moment onwards, Paul wrote two-thirds of this book I'm reading, the New Testament, and he, and, he, and he traveled the known world as it was then. He was shipwrecked. He was in hunger. He was exposed to the weather. He was stoned, twice left to die. He was whipped, I don't know how many times. He was treated as the offscouring of the earth. Why? Because of Jesus Christ. He said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Okay? In spite of all that, look what he says when he writes this letter to his, um, his Timothy. He says, therefore, this is verse 8 of 2 Timothy chapter 1, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner. And then he goes on in verse 12 and he says, For this reason I also suffer all these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep what I have committed to him until that day. 
verse 12 of 2 Timothy chapter 1. What? What a statement. That man didn't only believe what he preached, he knew what he was preaching. You don't suffer that kind of punishment by believing an old wives' tale or a fairy tale or learning something at school. It's when you meet somebody. He met Jesus on the road to Damascus. And after that, he said, I'm not ashamed. In fact, he says in Philippians chapter 3, verse 10, Oh, that I might know him. Know him more. Oh, that I might know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to his death. That is what we are needing for the greatest revival the world will ever see. And it's happening. We are needing to stand up and be counted. We are, we've got to stop compromising. We've got to stop making excuses for this book. This book is Jesus Christ in print. 1 John chapter 5, verse 7. There are three who bear witness in heaven. The Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit. We really need to be more outspoken for the Lord. Yeah, but Angus, I'm becoming unpopular. Of course you are. If you're not unpopular and I'm going to go the whole route, why not? Then there's something wrong with your preaching, sir. If your hearers have got nothing but good to say about you, then there's something wrong. Because I think it was D.L. Moody said, if everybody's got something good to say about you, be sure that Jesus has got nothing good to say about you. <laughs> Why? Because the gospel offends. You don't have to be offensive. You just have to preach this book. And you will offend people. Why did they crucify Jesus? For the very same reason. But I want to tell you something now. I've never met a man in my life who loves more than Jesus. I've never met a man in my life who's more compassionate than Jesus. I've never met a man before in my life who, who's picked me up and make me a new creature. No one like Jesus. And that's why we need to be prepared to stand up for him and not be ashamed of the gospel. Now, if we go to the book of, of Luke, uh, Luke chapter 9, listen to this, and verse 26, Jesus I've got the red letter edition. Jesus says, For whoever is ashamed of me and my words, of him the Son of Man will be ashamed. Just leave it there. Wow. So if you're ashamed of him, you can be rest assured. He says, I'll be ashamed of you. And he goes on to say in another, another scripture, and, 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 and I will not... Speak up for you in front of my father. If you are too afraid to speak up for me in front of men. We really need to start putting our faith into practice. You'll hear some people say, oh, yeah, look, there's a time and a place for everything. Have you heard that before? That's right. You, know, you can't just go around just talking about you. Why not? Why can't you? As long as it's done in a loving way, a compassion. You know, when I go to a, a hospital, I'm invited to a hospital. I'll go into a ward and there might be six beds in that ward. And this is a fact. I'll go up and as you know, I'm a quietly spoken man. <laughs> and a man a few words, I'm only joking. But I'm a loud speaking person. It's my nature. I'll walk into that person and I want to bring life to them, not death. And so I walk up and I speak to him and I say to him, do you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? And normally he'll say, yes, I do, Angus. Well, let's pray that Jesus will heal you. And you know, before I leave the ward, I look around and I see a person sitting in the, lying in the bed next to, to the guy I've prayed for. And I say, would you like me to pray for you, sir? Yes, please. And he might be a Hindu. That's right. A, a man of another religion. And I go and I pray in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. And as I'm about to leave, the man across the way says, can you pray for me too, please? And before I leave that ward, I've prayed for all six men. If you are too ashamed to speak up for Jesus, no one will ever ask you to pray for them. 
And some people come to me and say, I never get an opportunity. Why do you get all the opportunities? I never get an opportunity to tell people because you don't open your mouth. That's why. Yeah, but they might rebuke me. I might offend them. That's right. You might. But at least you'll give them a chance. You see, when I stand before Jesus one day, I don't want your blood on my hands. God's going to ask me one question. Did you speak to him? Well, Lord, I didn't want to offend him. Offend him. He's not even here. He's in hell. Because you never spoke to him about eternal life. We really need to start putting our faith into practice. Now, before I pray for you, because I'm going to pray that God will give you courage. I'm going to pray that God will fill you with his Holy Spirit so that you can be more outspoken, always in love, always in love, because God is a God of love. But I want to tell you something that is, you've probably heard, you have heard this, but maybe you've forgotten because we don't remember always. In the year 2015, which is five years ago, and I believe it was the month of February, there were 20 migrant workers. They were construction workers who were working in Libya. Okay? They were Coptic Christians from Egypt. And they were captured by ISIS. And they were kept in a room for three weeks, about two, three weeks. And they were told they were going to be executed. What they had to do was to deny Jesus Christ. In other words, to be ashamed that they were Christians and they would be let free. A lot of them were very young men. They had young wives and children back in Egypt. Fifteen of them came from one village. Can you believe that? But there was another man. There was 21 of them. And that man was a black man and he came from Africa. And his name was Matthew Ayariga. I hope I got that right, the pronunciation. And he came from the country of Ghana. And he was a migrant worker with these 20 Coptic Egyptians. And they were all kept together in one place. Now I have seen the video and I'm sure many of you have seen it. And if you haven't seen it, you need to Google it. Because ISIS, like always, the devil always makes a fool of himself. He thought, you see, that if they could televise or make a video of this horrific massacre, it would frighten the Christians out of Christianity. And so they actually videoed it. And you see the Mediterranean Sea, and there are two lines of men walking along the seashore. The line in the front are all dressed in orange jumpsuits, and behind them are men dressed in black, except the leader who had camouflage on, and they all had hoods over their heads, and they had swords. And these 21 men were told to kneel in the sand. And then they were asked the question, do you deny that you are a follower of Jesus Christ? They said, no, we are Christians. And they started at the top and they started to cut their heads off one by one. And not one of them was screaming or crying. They were just praying, Jesus, help us. And then they came to the 21st man who was a black man from Africa, I'm so proud to say that, a Ghanaian, Matthew. And they said to Matthew, and what about you, Matthew? And Matthew's words were, their God is my God. And with that, they killed him. Now, all they had to do was to recant. What does that mean? To recant means to say, no, I made a mistake. I don't believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And they would have said, and you're free to leave. And they said, we can't do that. He is our Lord and our Savior. And for that reason, they weren't rapists. They weren't murderers. They weren't uh, adulterers. They weren't perverts. They were Christians. And by the way, they weren't evangelists. They weren't priests. They weren't cardinals. 
They were workers, ordinary people, construction workers who died for their faith. But I want to tell you that today they are seated around the throne with all the other martyrs of Jesus Christ. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power. In Zulu we say, Amandla. The power of God under salvation for those who believe. First the Jew, then the Greek. So I want to pray that the Lord Jesus Christ will first of all give you courage to stand up and then ask the Holy Spirit to fill you with such a love for the lost that you can't constrain yourself. You have to ask people, do you know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior? Not do you know God. They'll say, oh, we know God. Because God is who you perceive Him to be. Do you know Jesus Christ? So I want you to pray this prayer with me. And I hope that you can say with Matthew, the Ghanaian, their God is my God. I want to tell you, folks, I saw a little video just before this program of a young girl. I don't think she was more than 18, 20 years old. A widow of one of those men. She said, I am so proud that my husband is a martyr. And he has joined the ranks with those who have gone before. What an attitude. Not broken down, woe is me, who's going to take care of me, who's going to feed my children? No, I am so proud that my husband is a martyr. Folks, that's the kind of faith God's looking for in these last days. And he will undertake for that lady, I know that, that widow, and he'll undertake for all 21 of those men who died for Jesus Christ. So please pray this prayer after me. Dear Lord Jesus, Today I know I have not been outspoken for you. I've always been concerned about doing the right thing. I've always been politically correct. Lord, I repent of that today. And I pray that I will never, ever compromise the name of your son again. Every opportunity I get, wherever it would be, that you give me the courage to say that Jesus Christ is Lord. And I will give you all the glory. Amen. Well, there we have it. So that opportunity is going to come sooner than you think. And God's going to make it happen. Just tell them what Jesus means to you. Just tell them that Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. And He died for me and for you. And He loves you. Until next time, goodbye. Thank you for watching today's message by Angus Bucket. We trust that you were blessed. For more information about Shalom Ministries or upcoming events, please visit angusbucken.co.za. Have you downloaded the free Uncle Angus mobile app yet? You can enjoy more messages like this as well as exclusive content direct to your device. See you next time. Goodbye.